I didn't practice that All right. Good afternoon. Let's go ahead and begin our service by uh, singing number 230. Number 230 in our songbooks. Glory to his name. Number 230. And we'll sing the first, second, and fourth. First, second, and fourth. salvation for each of us. We thank you for it. We thank you for the opportunity of gathering today to praise you and to worship you and to fellowship with each other. And I pray you bless us today. Teach us from your word. Help us accomplish your will this week. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, for our next song, we'll be singing out of this uh, book here, whatever number it is in yours. <laughs> it is the song, um, He Was Wounded. He Was Wounded. Okay, we'll sing just the first and you don't know how many? Oh, okay. <laughs> let's sing the first and the last. <laughs> Maybe we'll only sing the first. <laughs> All right, let's try that together. The first and the last together. <laughs> Thank you. 
but very good. You did a good, good job. <laughs> All right. Okay, before our message, let's go ahead and sing one more. Our next song is My Jesus Fair, uh, a couple pages over for me. Uh, is that? No. Oh, I'll do that this. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll throw up that song for me. <laughs> yeah. All right, My Jesus Fair will sing the first, second, and third. First, second, and third. encouraging people to come, and uh, it'll just be uh, probably John's family and us, <laughs> because he has to teach Sunday school, so uh, unless maybe we work out on that. <laughs> so, the plans are that. Now, if it keeps, you know, if it gets better, and we'll, we'll you know, contact everybody, and we'll, we'll meet as normal, but, uh, so we're going to delay the Easter service. We're not going to put it off. We're not going to cancel Easter. We're going to delay it. So next time we meet will be uh, Easter service, okay, and so hopefully that will be uh, not too far in the future. So pray for uh, those. Uh, Becca is in America, and uh, my brother's wife, Debbie, is in America, too, and they can't get back. And so uh, pray for them as they're uh, there, um, and pray for uh, you know those who have the coronavirus, that they'll get over it, and pray that this, this thing will uh, subside, and that uh, we can get back to normal activities as far as church activities is concerned. Uh, so pray for those. Uh, pray for uh, John in the Philippines. Uh, you know, he was here for years, asked for prayer for his area last week, and so please continue to pray for him in the Philippines there, and then pray for our area that uh, that uh, things will get better. I think they're going back to school next week, so we'll see what happens, but uh, just pray for the situation, and uh, pray for those who uh, are in, um, you know, the elderly and those who are weaker are more susceptible, so pray for them, uh, and then pray for uh, the church here, that God will direct, direct and guide us and keep you join, uh, safe and uh, protect us. And uh, the EWAS is called this morning and said they uh, had, were coughing and so they weren't sure so they weren't going to come to church this morning. So I pray for the EWAS family too. Okay, All right, let's go ahead and open with prayer. Father, we do thank you for your goodness to us. We pray that you would protect us and guide us. And we know that you are sovereign, and you're in control, and that nothing surprises you. And I pray we use this uh, situation to glorify you, uh, help us to um, 
remain faithful to you. And, uh, and sometimes we might not be able to gather together physically, but uh, thank you for the opportunity we have to, to get together uh, electronically. And then thank you for the opportunity that we have to uh, be back together hopefully soon and for you to help us and protect us and keep us in the center of your own. Help us to, to not neglect, especially in these last days, to not neglect the reading of your word and to study your word and uh, our relationship with you. And I pray you use us to encourage those around us who have no hope as we do and help us to, to remain hopeful, um, to not, not in a sense that we're not sure, but because we are sure. We believe your word and we know that your word is trustworthy, that you cannot lie. And we pray you help us to trust you and not look at circumstances, but look to you who controls the circumstance. Give us a good service today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. A uh, couple of... Uh, see that's on there. Yes, good. Then you want to look at... Uh, Consider one thing: uh, requirements for the disciple of Christ to be a disciple of Christ. Uh, what is required of a disciple of Christ? Now, this I, I'm not saying that this. If you do these, you will be a disciple of Christ. Okay, this is things that are required of a disciple of Christ. If you are a disciple of Christ, these are things that God expects from you. Jesus expects from you. And the language that is used in these verses that we'll look at is, um, you know, is very. Very unclear and very uh, not not ambiguous at all. Uh, there's no question about it. It's very clear, and so we're going to look at some verses today. Um, but seven things we're going to look at today that uh, seven requirements of a disciple of Christ. Seven requirements of one who is uh, claiming to be a disciple of Christ. And number one, he submits his beliefs, his attitudes, and his action to the instruction of Christ. Uh, a disciple is a learner. Uh, the, word, the Greek word is just simply a learner. Uh, and so anybody who is a learner must submit himself to the uh, one who teaches. Uh, otherwise, he's not a learner. Okay? And uh, the Bible says in Matthew chapter 10, verse 24, the disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his lord. The Lord is above the servant. A uh, servant is under the Lord. Okay? And so we must submit our uh, beliefs, our attitudes, and our actions uh, to that of our master. And we do submit our beliefs, our attitudes, and actions to our master. The only problem is sometimes we are our master. And so we believe what we think we should believe. And we have the attitude that we deem best, and we do the actions that we deem best. And then we're, if you decide your own uh, attitude, actions, and, uh, I'm sorry, beliefs, then you are not a disciple of Christ. You're a disciple of yourself, okay? Or your own, you are your own Lord, uh, better put. Uh, so if Jesus Christ is your Lord, and you are a disciple, then you must submit yourself to Jesus Christ as your Lord, okay? Uh, a disciple is a learner, one who uh, accepts the instruction of another and changes his opinion and his mind and his attitude and his actions according to the instruction he receives from another. And so, and we're in not only discipleship of Christ, any person who is a disciple of somebody, he, to learn something from somebody, you must submit yourself to that person. And to learn from Christ, you must submit your uh, beliefs, first of all. Uh, you don't believe what you believe, you believe what God says. Okay? Uh, many people, the problem they have is they, they, they are their own masters. They are the, own, they're the source of their own truth. Uh, they are the source of the truth to them. They believe something to be true because they deem it to be right. We don't do that. If you're a disciple of Christ, you believe something is true because the Bible says it, because God said it, because Jesus said it, and God revealed it to us, and we believe, so we submit our beliefs you know, uh, that's very, um, you know, most people want to decide what they believe is the truth. Uh, we don't decide what's true. We submit ourselves to the instruction of our master, uh, if we're a disciple of Christ. And our master, of course, is Jesus Christ. And so we do what we believe, what, first of all, what, what God says, what Jesus says, what the Bible says. Uh, 
so we submit ourselves in as far as what we believe. And then what we believe will reveal itself in uh, our attitude. What we believe will reveal ourselves, will reveal it to us. What, what we believe will reveal itself in our attitudes. Okay? Um, if somebody is uh, not thankful, it's because uh, they don't think that what happened to them was to their benefit. You know, some people are mad at God because he didn't do what they thought he should do. Okay? The Bible says, be thankful, be thank in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Whatever happens, we should thank God because God's in control and God has our best in mind. And so if some difficulty comes into our life, that difficulty is there for a purpose, for our good, for our benefit. But if you believe what you think, you can start saying, you know, this is wrong. It's not good for me to experience this difficulty. God doesn't love me, or God is not good, or God is not sovereign. God is not in control because this thing happened to me that I deem to be not beneficial. And we can start questioning God's authority or God's sovereignty. Um, and so we have an attitude of ingratitude, of anger, of fear, of whatever, because of what we believe. Okay? We need to take God at his word. And if we believe what God says, we'll be thankful for persecution, for trial, for tribulation, for hardships. Because we realize that God's in control. First of all, God is sovereign. He's in control. There's nothing he doesn't know. There's nothing he can't do. And so if God deems it beneficial for me to go through hardship, then I should say, thank you, Lord. I know you're sovereign. I know you're omniscient. I know you're omnipotent. I know you can do anything you want to do and everything is in your control. And so if you've allowed me to experience this, thank you. This is for my benefit. Sometimes we don't know what, how it will be, but we need to believe God's word because God says all things work together for good to those that love God, to those that are called according to his purpose. And so our belief affects our attitude. Our belief affects our attitude. If you have a wrong attitude, it's probably because you believe wrong. You misunderstand uh, what you know, what you're, what God is doing, you misunderstand or you don't believe what God has said is for your benefit. You know, when you face persecution or tribulation or trials, and you're not thankful and you're you're angry or you're fearful or whatever, it's because realize it's because you don't believe God uh, in that instant anyway. And so our belief affects our attitude, which affects our action. You know what we we do, what we do because of how we think and what we feel is right. Uh, and so, you know, here's the scenario. Okay, something happens to you, somebody does something to you uh, that, that is you know, wrong in your estimation. And then so you say, God, you're not in control, you don't love me, and then you hit the person. <laughs> okay, that's the action follows the attitude, which follows the belief. So we need to believe what God says. We need to submit our beliefs to what God says. If we think, you know, no, this can't be for my good. Then we're disbelieving God because God said all things work together for good okay, for those, to those who love God, to those who are calling to His purpose. We need to be thankful in everything. Everything gives thanks, the Bible says. And so we need to be thankful. We need to understand that things that happen to us are for our benefit. God allows those to come to us and us to experience those hardships for our own good and for His glory, number one, for our own good, number two, and for the benefit of others. That's why God allows those things in our life, and that's to our benefit. And so if we believe God in that, we have a good attitude and we have good actions. And that will be to uh, our benefit and to the glory of God and the praise of God and to the benefit of other people. And so, number one requirement of a disciple of Christ is that he submit his belief, his action, his attitude to his master, Jesus Christ. And then number two, uh, Jesus himself said in Luke chapter 14, which we'll look in a minute, uh, that we should value Christ above all other relationships. Okay? If we are to be a true disciple of Christ, we must value our relationship with Christ above all others. Uh, Luke chapter 14, verse 26. Luke chapter 14, verse 26 says, If any man come, and come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and child or children and brothers, brethren and sisters, yea, his own life also. He cannot be my disciple. He cannot be my disciple. So, if you don't come to, to Christ 
and say everything else is of every other relationship is of no consequence compared to that of Christ. Now that doesn't mean we should not love our you know father or mother or wife or children or brother. The other places in the Bible tell us to love one another, you know, and, and love especially love you know husbands love your wives. The Bible commands, and so it can't mean that you know it's not a contradiction. One one hand the Bible says love your wife, and the next one it says the hater, because it says right here, hate not his children, his mother, father, wife, and children, okay? No. It means that, you know, in comparison to our relationship to our master, uh, our, all other relationships are, are insignificant. So compared to our love for Christ, the other relationships may even seem like hate compared, you know. Uh, we put first Christ, our relationship with Christ comes absolutely first before any other relationship. Unfortunately, there are many people who, and many people call themselves Christians, and they put their relationship, their human relationships, above that of their supposed master, Jesus Christ. Uh, they, they are more concerned with what people think about them than what God thinks about them. They're more concerned to please people than to please God. They're more concerned to maintain a right relationship with people than to re maintain a right relationship with God. And they will sacrifice the relationship with God to maintain the relationship with people. We must sacrifice our relationship with people to maintain, if that's necessary. Now, you know, it's not always, you know, you have to follow God or, or love your wife. No, we should do both, okay? We should love God and love our wives too, okay? Um, I heard of, an illustration, and I used this illustration this morning a little bit, but I heard of a person one time who... I was in a, a meeting and was convicted of the Lord that the Lord wanted him to be a missionary. And so he went home and he said to his wife, I think God's called me to the mission field. And his wife said, well, I'm not leaving. My mom lives next door and I am not leaving this house. And so evidently he didn't become a missionary. Uh, I don't know, you know, he probably should have helped her and been more slowly. Maybe he should have come home and said, hey, we're going to be a missionary tomorrow. You know, maybe he should have tried to help her to develop a burden for uh, missions also. Uh, but... His relationship with others was secondary to his relationship with Christ. Uh, he should have put Christ first and you know, helped his wife to come along like that. But uh, his relationship with Christ and his, his um, relationship with his master, who is Christ, as a disciple of Christ, is more important than the relationship with anybody else, any other human relationship. Uh, and so we must put, if we are a disciple of Christ, we must put a relationship with him above a relationship with everybody else. Now, now most of the time, it's not, there is not a conflict. Most of the time, it's not a choose an either or. Uh, but most times, we choose. We choose to spend time with a person other than God. We, you know, we choose to spend time with our friends because we enjoy our, our friendship more than we enjoy our fellowship with God. That's wrong. We should put, we should spend more time. We should be, have, that, that should be a priority relationship over every other relationship. Uh, our priority should be you know, you, do you like to, if your friends call you and say, hey, you want to go to this, you, can you say no? You know, I don't like to say no either, but uh, sometimes, you know, if you haven't had your devotions, you probably should say, no, I can't go because I have to read my Bible, you know. You know they'll probably think you're crazy, but uh, can't you do that later? No, that's priority. So we must, all other relationships are secondary to our relationship with Jesus Christ, if we are a disciple of Christ. Because all other relationships are secondary. Uh, he is our master, he is our Lord. Our other relationships are not our master and our Lord. Okay? And so Christ, the relationship with Christ should come above everything else. Number two. Number three, the Bible says that we must bear our crosses. Uh, Luke chapter 14, verse 27 says, And whoso doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Okay? It says, Whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be be my disciple. What does it mean to, uh, to bear a cross? First of all, what is a cross? Uh, you know, so, well, that's, you know, something that ladies wear on as a necklace or some earrings or something. No, it's not a piece of jewelry, okay? What is the cross, what did the cross symbolize in, in Jesus' time? You know, now, now the, the symbol has kind of been lost in society and it's a state, fashion statement or something, but a cross symbolized death in Jesus' time, if you were put on a cross, you were dead. The Roman government had perfected execution by cross. And why did they do that? 
they did that because the cross prolonged suffering. It was it maximized suffering as a cruel and uh, uh, suffering way to die because Rome wanted to make sure that everybody else saw what would happen if you rebelled against Rome. It was a deterrent for other people, not only a punishment for that person, but it was a deterrent for other people to rebel against uh, the Roman government. And so, but a death, uh, the, the cross was a symbol of death. It wasn't a, a symbol of uh, anything else. It was a symbol of death. And so, if you uh, had anything to do with the cross, you were going to die. Okay, And so, we are, bear our cross means to be dead to self. It's, it's saying, I am not living for me. Okay? I am living for Christ. I am doing whatever comes to me, whatever God brings my way, I'm doing for him and for not for myself. We don't um, do what we do for our own pleasure. Did Jesus go to the cross for his own pleasure? No. Uh, the Bible says that for the joy that was set before him, he endured, endured the cross, but it wasn't fun, okay? Uh, it, was, it was joyful to him because he understood the effect of what he was doing. His suffering brought salvation to millions and millions of people. And our suffering should, if we see that as benefiting others, then we should be joyful in bearing our cross. Uh, but sometimes we want to avoid the cross. You know, most of us try to avoid pain. Um, and I'm not saying we shouldn't avoid physical pain, okay? But we shouldn't avoid, uh, we shouldn't avoid tri trials and tribulations that God brings to our life for our own benefit. And we should bear those gladly. We should bear the cross that God gives us gladly. You know, not complainingly, not gripingly, because... Just like Christ, he bore the cross and it was difficult and it was hard and it was cruel and it was physically torturous. But if Christ hadn't, and I'm glad, and we speak from our perspective, you know, thousands of years later we speak and we say, I thank the Lord that he sent Jesus Christ. Thank God that he sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross. And we are thankful that Christ bore our sins. And there are others who can benefit from our suffering. If you realize that others benefit from your suffering, or if you realize that you spiritually benefit from your physical suffering or your temporal suffering, uh, is that worth it to you? Can you find joy in that? And I think that's what he's saying. If you're going to be truly Christ's disciple, you must understand that the spiritual benefit and the eternal benefit to our temporal uh, suffering or temporal cross, whatever that is that God brings into our life, it's for, it's for, first of all, it's for God's glory. Second of all, it's for our own benefit. And thirdly, it's our, for the benefit of other people. And if we can see that God is working through this difficult situation, He is bringing things into my life that can only be brought into my life that way. He can only, he can, he's sanctifying me in a way that uh, wouldn't be otherwise possible or probably likely. Uh, then this is a good thing. This hardship, this trial, this persecution is a good thing because it is giving me an opportunity, first of all, to glorify Him. It's given me an opportunity to grow, to realize there's many, many benefits. And of course, I keep on saying, I'm going to, uh, one of these days, I'm going to do a, a message on uh, the benefits of suffering. Uh, there's many, many things that, good things that happen from suffering. It's a benefit to God's glory, and it's for our good, and it's for others also. And so, if we can see that, if we can see past that, we will be able to bear our cross gladly. We'll be able to bear our cross with joy, not because we like to suffer, okay? Uh, if you like pain, you're probably abnormal, okay? Uh, nobody likes pain, uh, but if you see the benefit in pain, uh, then it can help us to uh, endure. It can help us to understand the benefit and, and understand what God's doing, and we'll be happy that, you know, I, I used this illustration back a while back. I've had a couple of surgeries, and surgeries are not fun, but I'm glad I had them. <laughs> and uh, it was hard to go through, but the benefit was great, and all the problem was solved, and now I don't have all that other pain. So there's benefit, and so we must uh, bear our cross for Him. Okay. And then number four, uh, we must forsake all that we have. 
one who is to be is going is a disciple of Christ must forsake all he has. In, uh, Luke chapter 14, verse 33. Uh, a little bit down from the page from that other verse says, So likewise, whosoever be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath cannot be my disciple. What does that mean? Does that mean we have to give up every possession we have or we can't be a disciple of Christ? Uh, again, uh, we have to realize that what we have is not our own. We are bought with a price. We are not our own. Everything we have was given to us by God for a purpose. And that purpose is to glorify Him. And so everything we have, it, we're, what we have is just tools to accomplish God's will. If we see things that way, uh, so forsaking means to you know, let, go of control, let go of control of. You know, when you forsake something, you let go of control. We, there's something we hold on to. They're very important to us, and so we hold on to them, and then we consider them ours. This is mine. I don't want to let go of it. But if you realize that everything you have belongs to, and comes from God and belongs to God and is, is just a tool that He's given you uh, to accomplish His will, and it's not your own. You're not even your own. So everything you have is not your own. It belongs to God. Uh, it's God's. So whatever He wants you to do with it should be fine. Okay? So... We must let go or forsake all that we have if we are a disciple of Christ. We must see that everything we have uh, is been, has been given us for the benefit of Christ, for the benefit of serving God. It's a tool. Everything's a tool. Um, there's many, many uh, people in my life that have you know, taught me many different things. And this thing, my, you know, I'm the oldest in my family, but my second brother... He has demonstrated this throughout his life that what he has, you know, if, if God gives it and you need it, it's yours, you know. Uh, because it's not ours. If God gives it to us and it's not ours, it's his. And whatever we have belongs to God. And we should be willing to use it in any way that God gives us. Nothing in this earth is, is, tempor is eternal anyway. You can't take it with you. Now, you can't even keep it on this year, earth, mostly, you know, the stock market's sit down right now. And so if you own stock, you probably own a lot less than you did a couple of weeks ago. Um, you know, maybe you thought, oh, I got a lot of money. And now you say, oh, I don't have any money. <laughs> the temporal things are temporal. They're not eternal. And we should not value those things, the temporal things, over the eternal. And that's what the, the point of this is, to forsake all we have. We value eternal things. And temporal things are temporal. They are given us to help us to accomplish uh, the goal in this life, but they're all temporal. And they will all soon pass away. And so let's realize that all we have belongs to God. And so let's, if God wants us to have nothing on this earth, what's the difference? If we have everything, if everything you have belongs to God, then if you have a lot or if you have nothing, it all belongs to God, right? So why should you care if you have a lot or not? And, but we care because we think it belongs to us. Okay? We think this is for my benefit. This is uh, My things are for my benefit and mine. And, uh, and, and I, when you lose them, you're very sad because you think they belong to you. Uh, if you lose something that is not yours, you're not that sad, are you? Uh, but So everything we have belongs to God. And we should forsake all uh, for His sake to be a disciple. Now, salvation is, is, is free, but discipleship is costly. It costs us everything. If you're going to be a disciple, you must realize that everything you have belongs to God and use it for His glory. Um, and then number six, I'm sorry, number five. Um, yeah, is that what we were, number five? Yeah, they call it that. Uh, continue in God's word. Continue in God's word. Uh, the Bible says in John chapter 8, verse 31, And uh, then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. If you continue in my word, then you are my disciples in, indeed. Uh, our, our, the Bible is the most, and I, I say this all the time, you're probably tired of hearing it, but the Bible is the most, most important thing that you have is the Bible. God's Word is the most important thing. It, there's nothing more important in a right relationship with God than God's Word. 
God gives us his word. He gave us his word. It's from God. And we talked about this a couple weeks ago. Uh, it, and it's, it's given to us for a purpose. The one is given to us to help us to know God. We could not know God without his word. We could know that there is a God. God says the heavens declare the word of God. And the firmament shows his handy words. So the creation, in Romans uh, 1 says the same thing. The creation reveals a creator. And so we can know that there is a creator. We can know that the creator is a, a powerful being. And we can know that he's uh, some, you know, that he's an order. He has, a, he's a god of order things. But God has revealed Himself to us, and there's things that we can only know from God's self-revelation of Himself. We could never know uh, that in, through any other means. So God has given us His Word to help us to know God. So if you want to know God, then you must study God's Word. You must read God's Word. You must study God's Word. Memorize God's Word. Meditate on God's Word. And so we must have a relationship with God's Word. It's the most important thing that you can do is to uh, know God's Word, to read God's Word, to study God's Word, to understand God's Word. It's the most important because it's God's revelation, number one, of Himself to you. So if you want to know God, and then you have no more important relationship, right? If you want to know God, then you must uh, read and understand His revelation of Himself to you. If you want to know yourself, you must Understand yourself in light of God's uh, instruction to you about yourself. You know, many people think they know, you know, that I, you hear this phrase, you know, I, I know my own heart, you know, I know me, you know. No, you don't know you, okay? Uh, we think about ourselves sometimes differently than God thinks about ourselves. Who is right? We are not right. When we think about ourselves in a way that God doesn't think about ourselves, we are wrong. We misunderstand ourselves. And so to understand who we are, we must have God's Word. So not only to understand God, who God is, we must have God's Word. To understand who we truly are, we must have God's Word. And we must read God's Word to find out who we are. We don't know who we are. We deceive ourselves. Everybody thinks better of himself than God knows him to be. Um, you know, everybody knows they're not perfect. You know, if, if I say, are you perfect? Nobody, nobody, you know, in their right mind would say, yes, I'm perfect, you know. Say, well, I'm not perfect, but, you know. But they don't see themselves as God sees them. You know, God sees you as a sinner worthy of going to hell forever and ever and ever and ever without ever getting out. That's who you are worthy of. That's what you are worthy of. Okay? That's what God thinks about you. And people don't think that about themselves. If I say, do you think you are worthy of going to hell forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever? Most people say, no, I'm not perfect. And, you know, maybe I deserve a little bit of punishment, but punishment forever and ever. I, I, I didn't murder anybody or anything like that. Uh, they don't see themselves as God sees them. And so to understand our true condition, we must have God's word. And then to understand what to do about that, you know. Even if we did understand that we are sinners, we wouldn't know how to make ourselves right. Most religions, that's their... You know, teaching, you know, you're, there's something wrong with you, but you need to do this to make it right. And if you do this, then you earn salvation, or you earn heaven, or you earn, you know, whatever, okay, righteousness or whatever, okay? No, there's nothing we can do to earn righteousness. We're, we're hopelessly sinners, we're bound for hell, hell for eternity, and there's nothing we can do about it. There's no good work I can do, there's no... Um, you know, nothing I can do. I can't beat myself on the back until I bleed and pay for my sins. There's nothing I can do. So, God not only reveals himself to us in his word, he reveals ourselves to us in his word, and then he reveals what we must do to remedy the situation. There's only one remedy. Uh, God became a man. And he went to the cross and he paid the punishment that I owe. He died in my place. And he gives, he takes my sin upon himself. Jesus took my sin upon himself and God imputes his righteousness to me. And so I am can be considered righteous because of Christ who paid the penalty of my sin for me. And that's what that's only revealed in God's word. That is not intuitive. You know, people intuitively people think that they can earn their own salvation. That's why almost every religion in the world, other than true Christianity, and even some people that call themselves Christianity are Christian in name only, and they don't they believe in work salvation, which you cannot do. The Bible says, For by grace you're saved through faith and not of, your, not of yourself, the gift of God, not of works, that's any mention of those. And so we can't do anything to save ourselves. And so God's revealed Himself to us, ourselves to us, what we should do about that. What 
what we need to do to be saved, to have our sins forgiven. Okay? And then God's revealed many, many, much, much other, many, many other things. How we should live, what we should do to please God. You know, if, if it's important for you to please God, then you need to understand what God wants, right? Uh, otherwise, you're pleasing yourself. Uh, you cannot know uh, what you should be doing apart from God's word. We will come up wrong, you know. That's what most religions have, what they consider good works, okay? Uh, but those good works are not usually in keeping with God's word. And so, in order to how to live right, we must have God's word. And so, we, we've talked about this before, but... So, we must not only uh, do all these other things, we must uh, continue in God's word. Daily, we must be in God's word. We must continue in God's word. We must abide in God's word. Uh, we must we must continue our relationship with God through His Word. God speaks to us through His Word. His Holy Spirit lives within us, but the Holy Spirit uses the Word of God that we read to instruct us and to help us and to guide us. And so we must continue reading God's Word. And so Jesus said, um, if you continue in my Word, then are you my disciples indeed. Okay? People who claim to be disciples and uh, don't have a relationship with God and His Word uh, may not be His true disciples. They may be deceiving themselves into thinking that they are. And so we must continue in God's Word. God's will for us to continue His Word. Okay? And then, uh, number six, uh, love one another. Uh, in John chapter 13, verse 35, Jesus said, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have one, love one to another. Okay. Our love to one another reveals that we are disciples of Christ. We need to have the love toward each other at, that Christ had toward us. Uh, now, what does that word love mean? You know, the world redefines love. Uh, our, the, the definition of love according to the Bible, the agape love that, with which God loves us, is a self-sacrificing love. I, I said this morning, it's a, it's a one-way street. Okay? Love is a one-way street. It's not like, if you do something good to me, I'll do something to you. No. It's, I do what's good for you, no matter what you do to me. That's like God had. That's what God did for us. He loved us, even though while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. God loved us when we were unworthy of His love. If God waited to love us until we were worthy of His love, He would never love us. God loved us because He's love, not because we are worthy. And so we must uh, have that relationship with others. We must love other people unconditionally, what, no matter what they do no matter whether they deserve our love or not. That's the love that Christ showed for us. And when you do that, when you show that kind of love toward other people, that reveals that you're not in it for yourself. The world defines love as, you know, like a mutual um, mutual good feeling, okay? I make you feel good and you make me feel good. And, you know, I love you because you make me feel good. It's usually what it is, okay? When you stop making me feel good, I don't love you anymore. And that's usually what it is. It's, it's a self. It's a either a two-way street or maybe a one-way this way. Yeah, it's a, somebody said um, uh, it's like um, you know t a, a tick on a dog, okay? And then it said, then you find out it's two ticks, no dog. <laughs> you know? It's a tick on each other. You know? They're both uh, in this relationship for the benefit to the self, okay? And then uh, they realize that you know each is only in there for the benefit of themselves, you know. Uh, but our relationship with others is not like that. We should have a relationship. If we have the relationship that we should, uh, if we love one another like God loved us, then we will be loving to other people even though they're not loving to us. That's what God did. He was loving to us. We were not. We were, we were sinners. We were against God. We hated God. We were, we were rebelling against God. A sinner is one who rebelled against God. We were... In other words, we were shaking our fist in God's face, or spitting in God's face when He loved us and, and sent Christ to die for us. And so, we should love other people not because they're lovely to us. Uh, I know that's it's easier to love someone who is lovely to you, but that's, you know, it may be not true love. That might be love that you're just saying, hey, he's, he's nice to me, so I'm going to be nice to him. Okay? We need to be loving we need to have the benefit of others in mind, even if they don't have that same attitude toward us. And when you do that, that reveals your Christ cycle. You know, uh, that's unusual. Most people are in a relationship for mutual benefit. Okay, uh, most people um, love those who love them. Most people are friendly to those who are friendly to them. Most people are nice to those who are nice to them. Uh, but 
we need to be nice to people who aren't nice to us. We need to be loving to people who aren't loving to us. We need to be helpful to people who aren't helpful to us. And when we do that, that reveals that we're Christ's disciple. Because that's what Christ did. He loved us when we were not lovely. We didn't deserve it. We, didn't, uh, we were unworthy of his love. But he loved us. And so when we do that, that reveals you're Christ's disciple. You're like Christ. Because Christ loved us when we were unlovely. Christ loved us when we didn't deserve it. And so we need to love each other that way. And so uh, I need to love you in a way that whether you're you know, lovely or not, and you need to love me if I'm not lovely or not, because that's how Christ loved us for, uh, for our benefit. Uh, it was not for Christ's own benefit that he went to the cross. It was for our benefit. And then finally, number seven, uh, to bear fruit. If you are a disciple of Christ, you will bear fruit. Uh, the Bible says in John chapter 15, verse 8, Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. Okay? Bearing fruit is a mark of a disciple. A disciple must bear fruit. Now, what are fruit? There are many words uh, that in the New Testament that, that say fruit. Um, and there are many definitions of fruit. There are different kinds of fruit. Okay? Uh, if you see an uh, apple tree, uh, it is bearing apples. So an apple tree bears apples. More apples than an apple tree bears apples. Uh, a Christian bears Christians. Okay? So the fruit of a Christian, number one, is other Christians. Uh, we will be burdened to reach other people for Christ. If you're a Christian, if you're a disciple of Christ, your desire is to make other disciples. If you don't want somebody else to be a disciple of Christ, you probably don't understand what it means to be a disciple of Christ. Okay? If, you don't, if you don't desire that with somebody else, uh, if you don't want to forgive somebody else like Christ forgave you, you probably don't understand what Christ did for you. You don't understand his forgiveness. Okay? And so when you understand how much you've been forgiven, you know the parable that Jesus gave the one servant who you know, owed the master a lot of, you know, an unpayable debt, and the master forgave him, and then he went out and found somebody that owed him a little bit, and, you know, choked him and threw him in jail, or whatever. Uh, if we understood, if we understand how much Christ has forgiven us, how much he's done for us, uh, then it, it, it will not be hard for us to desire that for somebody else. We want them to be forgiven. Uh, and so, we must, first of all, evangelize. We must have a burden. If we understand what we've been forgiven, we understand that we are undeserving of God's love, that he loved us and he forgave our, all of our sins and we're on our way to heaven. We deserve to go to hell, but we're on our way to heaven. We want that for somebody else. And if we understand how much benefit that is, we should desire that for other people also. And so we should go to them and, and do everything we can to convey the gospel message to them properly. Of course, there are some who, you know, God has to worry. I, I can't save anybody. I can't save anybody. I can't convince somebody to be saved. You can't convince somebody to be saved. God has to work in their heart and uh, do the work of grace and, and work of salvation in their heart. But we get to be the bearer of the good news and we should have a burden. We have a desire for that person to be saved. Uh, and so many times I think we don't have the desire to see somebody saved that we should have. Uh, if we're a disciple of Christ... And we should desire to have other people saved. And the, the Great Commission, in Matthew chapter 28, uh, Jesus said to his disciples, uh, go make other disciples, okay? By teaching all nations, okay? So we must go and teach others, to disciple other people. And that's a disciple of Christ. That's what a disciple of Christ does. A disciple of Christ makes other disciples who make other disciples who make other disciples who make other disciples. Make other disciples. And so that is the fruit of a Christian. But then there's other kind of fruit. There's the fruit of the Spirit in a Christian's life. If we are what we should be, then uh, there, we should uh, display the fruit of the Spirit. I mentioned in Galatians. Galatians chapter 22 says, but the fruit of the Spirit, 22, Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23 says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such a law. We should display those things in our life. We should have the uh, fruit of the Spirit in our life if we are truly disciples of Christ. Because if we're disciples of Christ, we are saved, 
we want to serve God. We want to please Him. We're serving Him. He's our master, not ourselves. Then we are yielded to the Holy Spirit. As we read God's Word, He teaches us, and God's Holy Spirit will work in our life and produce love. The love I was talking about, the love for other people, the love for uh, evangelizing those who are lost, and the love for Christians. That is produced in our heart by the Holy Spirit. If we're a disciple of Christ, God will produce those that in our heart. Love, joy. Uh, we can have a, a sense of security even in hardship, even in trials, even in uh, uncertain situations because we know who's in control. And why would we worry? Okay? So love, joy, peace, and all sorts of things that, uh, all, all sorts of things that are a benefit, are, are a result of God's Holy Spirit working on. Those are fruits of the Spirit. And if we are a disciple of Christ, if we are a true disciple of Christ, those fruits will be evident in our life. If we are a true disciple of Christ, we will have the fruit in our life that reveals that we are a disciple of Christ. And if we don't have those, then that is an indication that we are not true disciples of Christ. We're not yielded to the Holy Spirit. We're not uh, valuing God's Word and the relationship with God as we should. And so, uh, let's realize that we are disciples of Christ. And if we are disciples of Christ, these seven characteristics will be in our life. These seven requirements we will be fulfilling. Not perfectly, uh, but that, those should be the goals that we have to do those things that Jesus said, without which we cannot be disciples. And so, let's realize, and, and if there's some in your life, as we were talking, if there's some that you are lacking in your life, uh, ask God to help you to see how you can develop those uh, areas in your life uh, which you see lacking in your life. And let's make sure that we are true disciples of Christ. Number one, we yield our beliefs, our attitudes and actions to work to Christ. We believe what God tells us to believe. We believe what Christ tells us to believe. Not what we believe. You know, many the world thinks it's weakness to believe what other people tell you. And of course, if you're talking about another fallible human being, yes, if you put your reliance upon your 100% of your reliance upon uh, another person, what another person says, yes, you probably are dumb. <laughs> okay, uh, but you, if you rely upon the sovereign, eternal, uh, the omniscient, omnipotent God, then. You, know, you must submit your belief to his instruction or, or you're not a disciple of Christ. And then these other things, we don't have time to review all of them. But, uh, so let's make sure that we are disciples of Christ. And if there's an area that we need to work on, let's make sure we work on that so that we can not only be a disciple of Christ, but other people can see that we are disciples of Christ and that we'll draw them uh, to, to Christ and to the gospel. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. And for this day, we pray, Father, that if there be somebody here today that does not know Jesus Christ or Savior, they're not a disciple of Christ, we pray that you would work in their heart, that you would bring them under conviction of their sin, and confess their sin, and accept Jesus Christ, the substitutionary atonement that he, produced, he made on the cross for them, and accept Jesus Christ as their Savior, and become a disciple of Christ. And I pray that you would help those who are disciples of Christ to be better disciples, and help us to see the areas where we uh, are trusting ourselves, or we're leaning upon our own understanding and help us to forsake that and to lean upon the understanding that uh, you provide in, in, in your word. I pray that you would draw us closer to yourself uh, make us better disciples of yours today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Alright, let's go ahead and close by singing one more song. Number uh, 371. Number 371, A Passion for Thee. We'll just sing uh, the first stanza, just one stanza of that as we close our service. 371. Maybe we can stop. Okay. <laughs>